Fox. Again, I'm Mark Bluefield, the titular head of the American Council for Capital Formation. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Landrieu. I'm going to go back in the audience, learn from her, and, and uh, we'll get it get LNG exports done. So, Senator, give us your wisdom and encouragement. Although it's not that early in the morning, I do not have much wisdom at 9 o'clock. It takes me a while to get wound up, but I thank you all um, so much for inviting me today. And uh, this is such an important topic, and I'm happy to just share just a few remarks with you all about it and then take a few questions because I know there are journalists here, there are lawyers, there are folks representing the oil and gas industry, um, their manufacturing situation. And it's a pretty exciting game to be involved in because it's about wealth building and prosperity and the expansion of the middle class and the expansion of economic opportunity. And from a state that's been involved for a long period of time in the development of oil and gas resources, both onshore and offshore, I can hardly put into words the excitement and the hopefulness of a state and a region like Louisiana and Texas and the Gulf Coast that have been through so many ups and downs, so many decades of plenty and then drought. To be now in a space, at least, you know, this is very broad, to be in a space where most of the people that I speak with on a daily basis at home and here that know about our region are just, you know, really almost overwhelmed with this new possibility of the technology and the finds of gas not only in places where they've been traditionally thought to be, but in new places all over America. And gas that's onshore, offshore, deep and shallow, and most importantly, the technology that can safely recover this gas and use it not only to fuel homes and automobiles, et cetera, but to also be feedstocks for a lot of the chemical manufacturing and just manufacturing that America needs because anyone building anything of any significance from a computer to a tractor uh, and beyond needs, you know, reliable, affordable energy. And what's so attractive about gas particularly is that it also meets some of the new important requirements and goals of the environmental, uh, our environmental goals as a nation. So that we don't, so Washington DC never looks like Beijing where you have to wake up and be afraid to walk outside or wake up and put a you know, bag over your head to go to work. It's really, I know that's not how Beijing looks every day, and I don't want the Chinese embassy to call and have to make me apologize. Um, but the fact of the matter is that America has done a very fine job, and my industries would say too fine of a job, in tightening down on environmental regulations. But the people running some of our largest companies in the world understand that you know, creating economic growth and protecting this planet are not mutually exclusive. So you've got this very interesting convergence of, of priorities of the manufacturing sector so excited they can actually bring their plans back. Just in Louisiana alone, between two cities, Lafayette and Lake Charles, this is not counting Baton Rouge, Alexandria, Shreveport, Monroe, just La Lafayette and Lake Charles. There's $60 billion worth of investments coming in. And it's all related to this issue, to either gas imports, exports, um, biofuels, petrochemicals, and because we're on that Mississippi River, which is the greatest river system in North America, and 70% of the grain comes from the Midwest out and back and forth through this river and many other products, and there's ample supply of water, these manufacturing plants literally we had one that um and my staff have to remind me so i get the country right it literally decommissioned put itself in packages and shipped itself over here what was that in peru Liz, do you think um, or chile i'm going to check so the journalists get this right but literally there was a plant 
in a country in South America, it not only decommissioned itself, but it packed itself up, shipped itself over, and rebuilt in Louisiana. Now, we haven't seen that in a long time. So this is exciting uh, opportunity, and what I'm hoping as a member of the Energy Committee and working with Ron Wyden and our secretary is to make sure that the federal government's policies don't you know, inadvertently stand in the way of what is overridingly a very, you know, a, a very good thing for the country, but also be sensitive to the fact that there are some parts of the country that aren't familiar with drilling and fracking, being sensitive to the needs for standards, and we hope those can be at the state and local level. And, and also to be able to understand how this market could find its own balance without regulating you know, exports. Because the fact is, while it's exciting, it's also very expensive. These are billions and billions of dollars worth of private sector investments. And so if, if the secretary, and we've had a number of talks about this, can, you know, get these permits and keep moving them forward, the market will eventually, we think, find its balance. And, and let me say one other thing. The reason I think I'm a pretty good person to talk about this is because not only is Louisiana a major producer of gas, we are a major consumer of gas. So as a senator, I represent both sides of this argument. Consumers that would really love to keep all the gas in America, keep it low and keep it trapped because they would love to have very cheap energy to build whatever they're building, giving them and us an economic advantage. But I know, and you should know, that if the price is too low, the, the producers won't find it because they can't get it out of the ground and make a profit. So it's very important to understand, and when you see Louisiana and Texas, you can appreciate, I don't want you all to think we're just states that produce gas and want to make a lot of money selling it. We consume a lot and then sell the refined products out of it. So we have a vested interest in getting this straight as well. And then, of course, people in Louisiana, contrary to what a lot of people think, we do care a lot about our environment. You know, we come from families that have been mining oil and gas in the same waters that they fish, swim, recreate, and catch a lot of food that they actually eat. Um, and so we are not unaware of the problems of trying to mine oil and gas on land or off, fish and hunt, and provide sustenance for ourselves and, and recreation. So I'm here to say that from my perspective, um, I just think this is, uh, like I started, a game changer for the country, a real opportunity, and I'm looking forward. I'm going to stay and hear the panelists because I would like to hear some of their views and thoughts on this. And, uh, and just thank you all for inviting me today and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Identify yourself when you ask the question. Why don't we start it? Yes, sir. Uh, I Google us with Argus Media. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, when this LNG terminals come online, Louisiana seems to have the most of them proposed. Uh, they're big, they're adding to the consumption locally, and uh, they're all, you already have large industrial consumers. And I'm kind of wondering, are they worried about uh, this extra? demand that appears there and uh, maybe competes with them. And are you worried uh, as a result as well? Well, that's what I tried to say. I mean, this issue is not just so new. I mean, it's relatively new, but it didn't happen last month. We've been talking about this in Louisiana and Texas now for several years. And the debate has been very public, very open between the petrochemical industry, the um, e and, um, exploration and production folks. And although there are a few outliers that have been made themselves known, I mean, initially Dow Chemical was you know, one of the most vocal kind of against the export strategy, or at least not against it, I shouldn't characterize in that way, warning that too many exports would be not the right thing for our country. Um, we've settled in in Louisiana and Texas understanding that this is going to be a, a balance, but that the market should find a balance. Um, that would be beneficial to the producers who can, the price will go up and hopefully a little bit over time, that spike, and that will incentivize the drilling 
that can be done in places, Pennsylvania, New York, um, Arkansas, et cetera. So yes, there's concerns, but they are abating, I would think. Don't be shy. This is not a shy group. <laughs> Uh, hi, Senator. Thank you with the Hill. Um, I've got a question about, you mentioned the environment. It's an environmental topic, not 100% related, or really, frankly, related at all to LNG. But um, Senator Manchin is going to be proposing some legislation that would um, very much soften uh, the EPA power plant carbon emission standards for the new plants, and then give, allow Congress to decide when they go forward to the existing plants. Um, are, are, do you intend to sign on to Senator Manchin's legislation? You know, I am very sensitive to Senator Manchin's position. I mean, he represents a state whose economic you know, past and present is in large measure related to coal. There are a few states, Kentucky, Tennessee, et cetera. So I'm very sensitive to the job issue for him. Um, I'm going to be speaking with the Secretary about it. I have the Secretary of Energy haven't made a final decision and the Secretary of EPA um, to get a little bit more detail before I make any final decisions. But I think that there's a possibility with new technology that some of this coal can be cleaned and used and sequestered you know, carbon and continue to be a part of the mix. Um, natural gas we think is a bridge to a cleaner energy environment. That's a long bridge, you know, it's a 10 or 20 or 30 year bridge, but it's a bridge to a cleaner future. Uh, when alternatives, the technology for alternatives can be more mature and more, more developed than they are now, and those alternatives would be um, you know, hydro, solar, nuclear, um, et cetera. So we just have to kind of, you know, find our way. The idea is not to put anybody out of business overnight, try to put rules and regulations that move people gradually to a cleaner, more secure energy future. But gas has a lot of promise. Um, and I guess with the right technology, coal could be a part of that as well. Uh, there are bills on the, on the Senate and House side uh, to move some countries like NATO uh, members or Japan into the FTA bracket in terms of uh, permitting uh, exports of LNG to those. Uh, do you think that's the right approach? Are you, are you supporting that? No, I honestly have to not go into too much detail because I'm not familiar. I mean, I'm generally familiar with it, but not in a lot of detail. But what I can say is that there are countries like Japan and like Israel, for instance, who are really in a very tough situation to try to get access to uh, clean, affordable energy. Um, and this gas find in America gives them real opportunities that weren't there before. And in Israel, I can say more about Israel than Japan because um, Noble Energy has led an extraordinary exploration off the, shore, off the coast of Israel to find some of the largest uh, deposits of natural gas in the world. And for Israel to go from a country that had virtually no um, outlet for energy in a very dangerous neighborhood, having to get energy across borders that were hostile, I mean, think about that. Um, this is really just a tremendous opportunity uh, for Israel. And so I think there are many opportunities for countries around the world that had to, in the, few, in the past, be reliant on countries like Russia, who have different views of democracy than, let's say, America has, for us to be able to supply our allies with the energy they need. It could have real implications for um, the world at large in a positive way. Uh, and so I'm really bullish on American gas, but I'm also very bullish on eventually using our brains and our technology and our science to find reliable, renewable sources of energy. Because I think for the growth and preservation of democracy, that's one of the most important things we could do. So people do not have to be reliant on countries that are not democratic are countries that are actually hostile to democracy for the energy we need to function. That's kind of a silly situation if you think about it, a foolish or dangerous situation. 
So it has economic implications for us, but it also has major uh, international implications that are very positive if we can get this right. Now, our, let me just end with this, because one of our problems, I don't want anybody to run out here and think, oh, everything's wonderful, even though it's very promising. <clears throat> but the challenges are real for this. Number one, we don't have enough skilled labor. <laughs> in Louisiana right now to build these plants. So having them paid for or financed and permitted is great. But if you don't have the people to build it, that is a problem. And right now we are short tens of thousands of workers to build these plants. And so you to realize while it's exciting to think about this manufacturing and this growth and this opportunity, the government of the United States has a real challenge to produce the workers to do that and the infrastructure necessary to support it. And that's why these infrastructure bills that are coming along are so critical to get done and there's some very exciting ideas floating around. The skills bills, uh, skill development bills and concepts that are floating around are really important and anybody in manufacturing in America will tell you that's almost their number one issue. Not health care, skills gap. And, um, and we need to be about the business of doing it. So I'm going to end there. Y'all got a great panel of experts, and I'm going to stay for a while to learn something. Thank you. For that, and uh, thanks to the senator for very interesting opening remarks. Uh, I just wanted to briefly introduce the, uh, the panel we've got here. We've got a great group of folks. Uh, to my immediate left, I've got uh, Margot Thorning. She's the Senior Vice President and Chief Economist at the American Council on Capital Formation. Uh, next, we've got uh, Professor Richard Smolensey. He's the Professor of Economics and Management at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, to his left, uh, Raymond Keating, the Chief Economist for the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. And joining us finally is uh, Mr. Simonis Satunas. He's the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Lithuania. Um, what I wanted to do was follow up actually on a number of the issues that uh, the Senator had raised in her remarks. Um, and, and it seems probably most important to start with the issue that has been galvanizing a lot of the domestic opposition to this, which is uh, price implications, economic implications. Um, we've seen a lot of studies that have minimized uh, the potential for U.S. exports of gas to really have, uh, you know, major price increases. Nevertheless, that seems to be the big fear behind a lot of the organized opposition to unfettered exports. So, Margo, I was hoping you could tell us, you know, what do we know at this point about how U.S. exports could actually affect the price of natural gas? Thank you, Keith. I uh, appreciate very much a chance to make a few remarks on this very important topic because, as the senator said, what the impact on natural gas prices is of increased exports is a real key issue and has caused uh, you know, quite a bit of debate in the press. But I think natural gas is like any other market. You know, it's uh, supply and demand are, are going to determine the price. So first you want to look at recoverable reserves. And the Department of Energy's estimates of recoverable natural gas reserves, every time they estimate it, it goes up. I think their most recent estimate is about two trillion two thousand TCF uh, recoverable. Other estimates in, that they've published suggest recoverable reserves are as high as uh, 3,600 TCF, which is 50 or 100 years supply of natural gas. So <clears throat> the reserve estimates keep going up. So the question is, what about domestic supply? What's going to happen there? A recent estimate by Vintec Energy, which is a division of McGraw Hill, suggests that domestic demand will increase uh, to about 82 BCF a day by 2018. And some of this data is in this paper that is it's in your handout. And the, the additional demand over the next five years is that the domestic demand is expected to be about 8.3 BCF a day. But supply is expected, potential supply is expected to increase by 2018 to about 14.3 BCF a day. So you can see there is a, a gap between potential natural gas production and, and demand here in the U.S. So exports to Mexico and to other countries through LNG can help fill that, the gap between supply and demand. And 
the impact on price uh, if you're exporting, say, between 6 and 16 BCF a day, a, a host of studies, including those summarized in the Peterson Institute study that Gary Huffbauer did, the other implications that I kind of touch on what the senator said was a host of studies demonstrate very positive impacts, not only on the gas producing states, <clears throat> but on the uh, overall overall economic growth. It's an ICF study that calculates that increased exports would generate between about 70 to 450,000 new jobs annually between now and 2035. Uh, GDP growth of between 72 and approximately uh, 76. Uh, as President Obama goes to New Orleans tomorrow to talk about exports, it, it would be a wonderful thing, you know, if he could you know, say positive things about more rapid uh, permitting of the air and increase the uh, rate of permit. So I think I'll stop there and let. Um, Great, thank you very much, um, Professor Smolensky. One of the uh, you know refrains that you hear a lot is that the U.S. is a nation of free traders. Um, that's sort of the default position. On this particular issue, you you suddenly saw a lot of uh, arguments on the need to to step away. Uh, even briefly for, for certain accepted products from, from free trade dogma. And I wonder if you could just sort of give us the, the broader perspective of how uh, free trade in an energy such as LNG, you know, can, could you restrict that at the same time you're reading the Riot Act to other countries who restrict trade in, uh, in critical minerals, for example? Not easily. I, this is a very strange debate in historical perspective, right? In, the 2000, in his 2010 State of the Union address, President Obama called for doubling U.S. exports. Now, nobody said, what a terrible idea. People said, that's unrealistic. How are you going to do it? Nobody said, what a bad idea to export. This. We don't restrict exports in this country except for sanctions and in some cases for national security. So why are we having this debate now? We're having this debate now because of a provision in the Natural Gas Act of 1935, passed in the Depression, when neither we nor anybody else had much faith in markets, well before the U.S. led the world to freer and more open trade, that just sat there, nobody thought about natural gas exports, uh, for all those years because we were building import terminals and we were importing gas from Canada. So suddenly, the prospect of natural gas exports arises, and we invoke this provision to say, wait a minute, we ought to restrict exports maybe because maybe it's not a good thing even though we export lots of other things. Timber and software and airliners and corn and wheat and on and on and on. We don't talk about it restricting those. And it gets worse because we, in 2009, went before the World Trade Organization with others and challenged, under the provisions by which we're bound, Chinese restrictions on exports of rare earths. And we beat the drum about what a terrible thing it was and how it violated their treaty obligations. And the notion that we're now going to turn around and invoke a Depression era uh, statute and say, well, maybe we shouldn't export this stuff that we have a lot of, just as the Chinese have a lot of rare earths. That's just a very strange position for this country to be in, and I must say it, it doesn't do us proud. If, if I could just take a, a couple of minutes to second Marco's comments, on the economy, I mean, a couple of things looking internationally are important to keep in mind. We're not the only country that has a lot of shale. We just move quicker because of domestic institutions and infrastructure and regulatory and uh, legal legal uh, uh, structures. China has a lot of shale. Argentina has a lot of shale. <laughs> Poland has a lot of shale. The list goes on. The latest DIA report says that. We're not the only potential exporters of natural gas. Qatar, Australia, Indonesia, others are active in this market. So, not only does a hard look at the U.S. say that conceivable exports won't raise prices much because there's going to be a supply response because there are a lot of reserves, but internationally you have to say there are a lot of other players out there. So the notion that we're going to export an enormous amount into this world market strikes most observers as, as unlikely. Moreover, I'll end with this, um, you have to remember this is not 
mostly, this is not just putting gas into a pipeline. You have to liquefy it, you have to transport it. Cost estimates are comparable to current U.S. domestic prices. So if you think about it, the cost of liquefaction and transport gives you a delivered price, depending on the market and the details, that say roughly double the prices in the U.S. now. We may be able to compete with those prices because prices in Asia are high, but what this means is U.S. consumers will still continue to enjoy historically low prices that are lower by international standards. U.S. manufacturers will retain a competitive advantage, at least until the market is, the international market is flooded with shale, and that's going to take a long time. That'll take decades, I think. So the notion that this wonderful good news is going to be undone by the kind of exports that make economic sense uh, is just implausible. And again, the irony of the U.S., which over so many decades led the world to free trade, which fought so hard against export restrictions, to restrict exports, uh, it, it, not a pretty picture. Thanks very much. Um, Raymond Keating, we've heard a couple of points about the economic impacts of natural gas. Uh, you know, keeping it at home, we've seen huge impacts for manufacturing, especially feedstock intensive petrochemical firms. Um, Dr. Thorning referred to studies that exports could actually serve as a motor of job creation as well. And I wondered if from the perch of, of sort of the sinews of the economy, the, the, the small businesses, um, you know, how would uh, uh, a greater export policy actually affect job creation, investment, economic growth uh, in that neck of the woods? Sure. Um, it's, I want to echo Dick's comment that uh, this is a very strange debate uh, to be talking about limiting exports, and I say that uh, as an economist, but also from a uh, from small business perspective. We did a report earlier this year, which is on our website, sbcouncil.org, uh, on the benefits of natural gas production and exports uh, for U.S. small businesses. And we just look at the straightforward numbers, Census Bureau data on employers and so on, and it's, this is one of, let me backtrack, this is one of those issues, you know, I've been a depressing speaker for the past six years. Uh, you know, I'm an optimist at heart, I work for a small business group. Uh, but it's been tough, but I love talking about this issue because it's a win-win-win scenario, if you will, from a, uh, from the economic uh, perspective and from the small business perspective. This is one the one issue where I can say, wow, this, there's some great things going on uh, in the economy. And from a small business perspective, it's whether you're a consumer of, of energy, whether you're a uh, small manufacturer or a technology company or so on, you use natural gas. Um, and then obviously, um, if you're in the energy sector, and that's what this paper focuses on. You know, we hear about energy, and we think big oil, blah, 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 big this, big that. Um, but when you look at the actual energy industry, it's overwhelmingly about small businesses. And this has been a nice contrast, because you know, the paper walks through the numbers on um, uh, job creation, walks through the numbers on you know, business creation. The period that we look at, the uh, number of employers fell nationally. But when you look at the five sectors, key sectors of the energy industry that we look at, there's actually growth, right? Uh, job creation down nationally when you look at the key sectors, uh, job growth. And it's overwhelmingly, uh, in terms of the businesses that populate this sector, uh, small and medium-sized businesses. You know, whether you want to use the cutoff of 20 employees or you want to use 500 employees, we break it out. and. Depending on which sector you're looking at, 70, 80, 90 percent of firms are small and mid-sized firms. So energy is very much uh, about small businesses. So you look at the benefits we've had from expanded production, you know, since really f from 2005 forward, and when you look at the, the increased demand internationally uh, and our opportunity as exporters to meet that demand, quite frankly, it's a no-brainer to follow that. You know, the businesses in this sector, the small firms, are going to benefit tremendously. Um, and that's, you know, the overall point of our paper. And, and looking ahead, and, you know, you could also look at exporters and, you know, 97, 98 percent of, of known exporters in the U.S. are small and medium sized companies. So that's all good news, uh, again, from a small business perspective. I think Dick and Margo are absolutely right. The studies that have been done generally in terms of there being a, a very small impact uh, on prices and still being highly competitive compared to the rest of the world in terms of natural gas prices is spot on. You know, I tell my students, 
in economics class that you know we're not a zero-sum game. That that's what the economy is. It's not zero-sum. If we export more natural gas, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have less natural gas at home. Because why? We price signals. We go out. We explore, and we find more. If the last few years haven't shown that, I don't know what does. Innovation, technology takes us to new places, uh, and we've been seeing that for the past several years in both natural gas uh, and oil. Uh, and and talk about the the increased projection on proven reserves, proved reserves. Uh, you know, Daniel Jurgen in his book The Prize, seven many years I don't know how many years ago that came out, but uh, he perfectly captured the idea that um, the doom and gloomers on the energy front uh, and most of the projections that the government turns out uh, putting forward turn out to be grossly wrong and their lives they grossly underestimated again because of the advancements in technology and how the market works and how we're incentivized. I love the fact that the Senator talked about incentives as an economist. I wanted to stand up and cheer. Uh, and that's how the market works. And we shouldn't be fearful in any way, shape, or form of experts. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, Mr. Satunas, um, this has got to be a totally surreal debate for you um, to watch people try to figure out exactly how to handle energy abundance. Uh, I'd be curious for your thoughts on what the U.S. production boom and the prospect of gas exports mean for countries such as yours, which have historically been a little bit supply restricted, and the suppliers they have are uh, special players on the international scene. Okay, thank you so much for including me to this panel and thank you all for really looking at the international perspective. Uh, I just wanted to let you know, probably you know, the Baltic states, we emerged from the occupation of the Soviet Union, 20 years being independent. Uh, we are in the same defense alliance with the United States and NATO. We are in the European Union. We're definitely the members of the World Trade Organization. And uh, still we are not fully independent in terms of the energy. And uh, you might call us, or many people in Europe are calling still the energy islands. Uh, why? Because we are, you can call us gas-locked countries. Because we are importing gas only from one source. And not like the gas is coming from one country, but technically there is only one uh, supply. So what we do in our country to solve the issue, we are building this first LNG uh, import terminal in the Baltic states, which is uh, going to be very flexible, uh, very quick to build, it's floating terminal, and you know, we are moving very, very fast. So this ship, this uh, floating terminal, which will be able to import the uh, LNG in the Baltic states, will be at our shores already next year. <coughs> so Lithuania, we would be ready to import this gas, LNG gas, from global markets, uh, wherever it comes, from United States or from other uh, global markets already next year. So we want definitely the countries like the United States to move uh, really quickly as well. Uh, and uh, the competition in the global LNG markets uh, would be definitely uh, greatly, uh, in, will greatly impact us. Because it's not that uh, only we have only one gas pipeline, one supply, but the prices are really, uh, probably we're paying the highest price in Europe for the gas that we're getting from our uh, big neighbor. So we need alternatives, we need uh, to create a real market up there. This is what we're trying to do, like the presidency of the European Union, because we are the presidency of the European Union now. Uh, but we cannot do by uh, alone, so that's why abundance of the gas uh, that might flow into global markets definitely will impact very positively and, and, and very directly us all in uh, what I can tell. Uh, we want to have a market, we want to have alternative, we want to have a competitive price. Uh, but uh, we're just the uh, the consumer or the one end of the of the supply chain. But uh, it's very exciting to see your debate, and it's really exciting to see what you do and how you really uh, develop your resources. And uh, we are looking for the more positive uh, and more more licenses for the countries like we are. And as you know, we are. We do not have a free trade agreement with the United States, so we are so-called non-FTA country, well, Europe. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but we believe that the more license will be issued. Just uh, it, it is taking time and like uh, 
uh, you all were mentioning, it, think, it, it takes time to develop the terminals here to do the business plans, uh, but we are ready. We are ready next year already to do this. <laughs> And it took uh, for us really not a lot of time uh, to do that because uh, we find good business uh, solutions. So we're just looking at your end and I hope it's going to really move more quickly. I, uh, I, I want to take the, the privilege here to follow up with one point and then I, I will open it up for some questions. But um, it, Professor Smolensky, you just made this point and, and Mr. Stunis, you did as well in terms of the pace of this, uh, the pace of the permit. And so one of the questions that, that seems to come up a lot is uh, Qatar, Australia, uh, East Africa, Eastern Russia, maybe the Eastern Med. There's a lot of future potential sources of supply uh, that are also angling to get in on this market. Is the U.S. at risk of missing the window? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think the risk is... Well, we could easily miss it if we really go slow. I, I don't think the gas from new shale sources abroad is going to come on stream rapidly uh, for a variety of reasons. But I do think expansion of gas exports from conventional sources is likely. Um, and frankly, I think there's this long queue of applications. Nobody thinks all those terminals will be built simply because it takes time to build them, it takes time to finance them, to line up the contracts. But if we go very slow with permits, yeah, a lot of those projects could, could get quashed because the supply from elsewhere had come on quicker. Uh, there, there's no economic reason to go slow issuing permits. The market will just ought to decide which terminals get built and how fast. Um, Putting in an artificial delay can only handicap the U.S. internationally. How much depends on how slow. Any other thoughts on that? Yes. Yes, go. <laughs> no, yes, that's it. <laughs> the, the point is the market has its own pace, will decide. Um, we don't need government gumming up the works, as I like to say, in terms of artificial slowing again, to put this spot on. One thing I heard a rumor, and maybe somebody in this room uh, knows this better than I, I heard that Secretary Lamentz was in Japan last week, and they were asking about LNG exports, and he made the statement that it was going to go slowly. So if that happens to be true, you know, that could really impact how our companies are able to move ahead and get contracts and get their facilities built. So we hope that that's You know, we uh, we're definitely looking uh, like a possible. We are small uh, in terms of the amount that we might uh, buy, but our terminal will be able maybe even to be the regional one to supply our neighbors as well. So we are looking not only at the U.S. market, we're looking to all the markets. Uh, we cannot sit and wait while the terminal is in there. <laughs> And we look for a gas. So I really, we, we also closely very follow the initiatives here on the Hill and uh, by the Congressman Turner and by some senators on the Senate side about the LNG for American allies. So maybe it might be a solution for you all really to help your economy. We will help your economy buying your gas and help also your NATO allies that we are in there. But, you know, the national markets are developing, so we are looking all uh, for all the options, all possibilities that will work for us. We cannot, like I mentioned, keep the terminal floating up there without any gas. All right, we've got uh, some time. I wanted to throw it open for any questions we have from the floor. So again, just a reminder, anyone that does have a question, just identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ansel Riolato from FBR Capital Markets. I had a question for uh, Mr. Uh, Santunas about pacing. Uh, given, maybe you can speak a little bit about uh, the Lithuanian experience and broader the Baltics or other European countries. Given long term or take or pay contracts with uh, with Russia, how? What do you see as the pace being for? realistically getting out of those contracts or negotiating out of those contracts or renegotiating them and switching on to more LNG. 
Yeah, so uh, it's a very good question, but uh, in our case, everything goes uh, in a package. Uh, so you are absolutely right. Uh, to have the alternative gas to flow into our system, <coughs> you need to have a gas, you need to have the technical capabilities to import, and you need to have a legal environment to do that. So as you know, European Union uh, has introduced uh, the so-called third energy package, which means the unbundling uh, of the uh, of the activities that the energy companies have to implement in Europe. It means uh, the companies that uh, implement, uh, importing gas cannot own their gas uh, pipeline systems. So we, Lithuania, we are exactly doing this. We're implementing the energy uh, third package, doing the bundling, and we believe that we will be able to do it in a couple of coming years. And uh, that will allow uh, us to have uh, legal, not only technical uh, possibilities to offer or to use our pipeline system to import the gas from alternative sources. Yes, we have a long-term contracts with the Gazprom and uh, we are renegotiating now them. Uh, some of them probably stay, some of them will go, but it doesn't mean that uh, we can have uh, alternatives coming in. So this is the whole picture what the Lithuanian government is doing, some other Baltic states as well, and this is the, we are greatly supported by European uh, Commission and European Union. We are creating the market. Sean Sullivan, I'm a reporter with SNL Energy. Just to follow up, are you looking for spot cargoes or would you look at uh, long term contracts as well with some of the US LNG export terminals? At the moment, I can just tell you that uh, our floating uh, terminal ship, which is being built by a Norwegian company in South Korea, we are going to lease the ship. The storage of the ship we're going to lease for 10 years. So otherwise, I cannot come you on the on the possible contact. Uh, Canada Radio uh, Professor Schmalzi, you said that the United States may miss the opportunity if it moves too slow. Can you give any more granularity on what too slow means? In the months between each presentation, or I can't. I, I guess you know. Secretary Moniz was a close colleague of mine at, at MIT, uh, but we have not spoken about this issue and my telepathy skills are weak. Um, I, I just think there's a tendency, uh, when, you, when your hand is near a lever, to want to use it. And I think what may be going on is his sense that, gee, if we move too fast, then people will sink money into terminals that will turn out not to be economic. So if we just measure the pace, why we can make sure the investment's efficient, I think that's just wrong. I think that's just wrong as a matter of economics and a matter of policy. I can't give you granularity on timing because I don't know what foreign producers are planning. I don't even know what kind of contracts Lithuania is looking for. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, if you think about the pace of change in this market, um, over the last five, six, seven years, the notion that there's any merit in going slow strikes me as, as just implausible. But I can't give you great clarity. Uh, I think the forecast uh, timing here would be almost certainly wrong. <laughs> well, just to follow up on that, in one of the handouts that we've uh, given you, there's a list of 63 projects, international projects, that are either been built or contemplated. So, I'm just following up on what other panelists have said, it's uh, very likely additional resources are going to come on stream from other countries. So, you know, the sooner the better in terms of allowing the market to determine which terminals get built to. There is a lot of competition, a lot of gas out there. Uh, I just wanted to follow up with one point, and, and again, this was coming from something that, that Mr. Satina said, but also the Senator had alluded to this in her remarks. Uh, we had the legislation in both houses, that gas act for, for NATO allies, uh, that would explicitly use exports as a geopolitical carrying the stick sort of device. You could reward your allies in Europe, you could implicitly punish uh, other actors. There's another school of thought out there, and I think the administration has made some noises in this direction, that what it wants to do with exports is democratize energy markets, break the oil-gas linkage, uh, you know, increase in liquidity. 
And so I wonder if you guys had any thoughts in terms of you know which would actually be the, the better approach, to use this as a very targeted sort of geopolitical weapon, or to just focus on you know opening up energy markets and hoping, hoping to reap those benefits? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in, let others correct me. I, think, I don't think the stick is big enough, given our position in world export markets to use that way. I think that the better strategy is first domestically the extent that we can use this to uh, reduce our dependence on oil, period, imported or domestic, uh, since it's all one market, we strengthen ourselves internationally. Second, to the extent that we can democratize markets uh, internationally, both by our exports and ultimately by the exports of others, so that world markets aren't so dependent on a small region, we gain geopolitically. I mean, the question is, who would you rather have the Japanese dependent on for energy? Uh, U.S. exports or perhaps exports from China when China develops its vast shale resources uh, or exports from the Middle East because Japan isn't going to have anything at home. Uh, I think geopolitically, well, I wouldn't try to fine-tune it. I think you get resentment, and I think it overstates our potential impact in the world market. I think pushing, as we have historically pushed, to open markets, to free markets, for more liquidity, for diverse supply, benefits us and benefits our allies broadly. Yes, tr trade is always positive. The more we can uh, export in this area, it strengthen up, strengthens us in a variety of ways geopolitically, I think, but the key is, and we've made this argument over and over again, right? You open up markets, we should be the ones that show the rest of the world as an example that we're opening up our markets, and what are the benefits of that um, in terms of a country like us being able to export and bring these resources to the marketplace and giving other uh, countries and individuals and businesses around the world choices. So it's 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 a win-win all the way, and I wouldn't, you're absolutely right, I wouldn't get into the fine-tuning game. Uh, just the idea of remaining open, both on the import and export side, is a good thing uh, for, for our cause globally. Would that hold true in the case of, say, you know, getting away from just the NATO allies, but uh, Japan, uh, post Fukushima, a lot of energy needs, trade deficit now, the U.S. in the middle of the rebounds to Asia. Might be a nice time to sort of bolster your historic ally in the region, but you you, you say the free trade principle should trump those sorts of targeted measures. Well, why the free trade principle wouldn't exclude that, right? It would. It would be, but you're not an FDA country right now. And I would argue that you know we should go the route of, of making as many countries FDA countries, which is something we haven't done <laughs> during this administration uh, in any way, shape, or form. So any way that we can advance it is a good thing. When I say I don't, you don't want to fine tune it too much every opportunity that should be capitalized on in terms of, of expanding that. I mean, the notion of making lots of countries FTA countries for this purpose strikes me as fine. The, no the notion of continuing aggressively on the Trans-Pacific Trade Negotiation strikes mm -hmm. me as also terrific. So, Do we have any more questions from uh, the audience here? Sir. Bruce McKay with Dominion, and my company has the Cold Point Project in Maryland, of course. Is it fair to ask the moderator a question? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no one's here to listen to me, though. So okay. Well, I'm writing for the Wall Street Journal for a long time, as you have. I have to ask, when this debate is reported on, it seems it's always said that the broadly the manufacturing chemical industry opposes. And really, it's a number of companies that you can count on two hands. It's not the broad industry. But yet, they're, they're, uh, they, they get more attention, I think, than the number would want. Why is that? Is it that every good story needs to have <laughs> two sides? Let's talk about climate change. Yeah, yeah no, I was, I was just going to say that. You know, climate change is a good example of where you, you always need uh, two to tango. Yeah. Um, and and this, this is actually true, but I think a lot of that, too, is also the, the leadership at Dow. Um, that Mr. Livers is a, is a colorful, outspoken quote machine. And I think that helps when you are trying to, you know, drum up. You know, if you're trying to write a story for the paper about the, the approval process, the, the conditional approval process before a FERC approval for a big piece of infrastructure, you've got a high bar to get over before, you know, you're going to wake people up. And so if you actually have kind of a, a couple of corporate titans going back and forth and, you know, very large companies with, you know, a lot at stake, I think that perhaps inflates to a certain you know, extent the tension there. So. Any other questions? 
I, I just wanted to jump in on one, one question that uh, is of particular interest to me, which is China. Because, uh, you know, China is, is trying to rejig its domestic energy supply. It's trying to restructure its economy a little bit away from heavy manufacturing. Uh, they're trying to reduce the share of coal in the mix. So all signs point to this being a decade of gas for China. Uh, they don't have a whole lot right now domestically, so this points at being a decade of imported gas for China. Uh, they've got some from Russia, some coming across the pipeline from Myanmar, but you know, there's a lot of reasons to think that China could be a potentially very large LNG market. Uh, and I'd just be curious what uh, all of the panelists thought about, you know, would that be politically palatable in the U.S. to ship our cheap gas to the workshop of the world? And would that be politically palatable in China to be partially energetically dependent on, uh, on the big rival? Let me just uh, say, you know, the forecast is that by 2020 the U.S. will be a net exporter of energy. And if we could uh, make agreements with China to export, you know, you remember the line from the Godfather, keep your friends close but your enemies closer? Not that China's an enemy, but, you know, to the extent this could help smooth some of the relationships with that very important country, I think it would be to our advantage to export to them. I wouldn't focus too hard on bio, too much on bilateral trade for it. We always tend to do that, but you know, once the tanker's at sea, the tanker can go wherever it wants to go. So whether we export directly to China or whether we export to countries that therefore import less from countries that export to China, <coughs> pulling China into this market is a is a good thing uh, geopolitically for all of us. I think China might import more, uh, although I must say, if I were the Chinese, I'd be working really hard to figure out how to get to that shale. Uh, the, shale the Chinese have water problems, and the shale is not located in convenient places for them. They have not fought shy of massive engineering projects related to water, and you can imagine them trying to do something to get at it. But they have potentially enormous shale resources. Are they going to import until they can get at those efficiently? Uh, I don't know, but, but they do need to do something to avoid choking. It's a, uh, China's interesting, I mean, we could have obviously a whole, we could have a whole semester course on China and where their economy is, where it's going, uh, truth versus fiction and so on, but I think the, uh, on the energy front it's fascinating because we do have an opportunity here to create some ties on the geopolitical front, um, open some avenues of, of negotiation and diplomacy and, and, well, getting, we have those already, but I mean, getting closer, and it's not just on natural gas, but also their interest in oil. They have interest in the Middle East, obviously, and and it's going to be interesting to see how we react because we're not only increasing more on domestic production of natural gas, but also oil. Obviously, we're going to what projected to surpass uh, Saudi Arabia as the top oil producer in 2017 or somewhere around there. So this, um, but that doesn't mean that you know some people would say that we should bring everybody home. I'm not that <laughs> in that camp. I think it creates an opportunity for us. To, um, to, to work on all these issues from a greater position of strength. But I think we have opportunities with China in a positive way. It could turn negative, but a positive way in terms of how we deal with the Middle East, which I think is really fantastic. Can I, can I say a little bit about an issue that hasn't come up that I'm surprised hasn't come up? Sure. That's the question of the environmental impact of increased, increased production, which I know a number of environmental groups have, have pushed hard on. I think that's not a trivial issue, but I think the appropriate response to that isn't to focus on exports, it's to focus on making sure state level regulation is rigorous and effective. I mean, we've been producing natural gas at large scale for a long time, we've been fracturing for a long time, many of the risks are understood in various parts of the country. The new story here is the, the fracturing fluid and the wastewater that comes up that needs to be treated. Everything I know tells me this can be done safely. It can be done safely and properly regulated. And it seems to me that the right environmental focus is to make sure it can be properly regulated is not going to kill it on the cost side again, to make sure that's done effectively at the state level so that A, this boom continues without a three mile island kind of catastrophe that, that slows it down for all of us, and B, to make sure the environmental impact is, is, is minimized. But that said, 
I think the environmentalists who say, well, we can't do exports because fracking has environmental impacts, are just going after the, the tail, not the dog. I mean, go after regulating the whole operation um, uh, appropriately, not, not limiting exports because there'll be less of something you don't like. Make it more likable. What kind of follow-up to that bring you to the World Cup? What about the environmental impact of transport? Shipping LNG? Yeah. I suppose we're going I think the difference is pretty minimal, unless I misunderstand. I mean, it, it, the, the overall environmental impact, Senator Landry spoke of coal, and to the extent, for instance, if you care about climate change, as I, I must say I do, the, the environmental impact of shipping natural gas abroad to be burned instead of coal was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and burning it here instead of coal is overwhelmingly positive, not just in climate change, but local air pollution. Uh, so I, I don't worry much about the, about the uh, energy consumption of shipping. It, it seems to be a third order effect. Do we have any more uh, questions this morning? If not, then I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our panelists. Also, thanks, Senator Landrieu. Have a good day.